All right. Well, good morning, everybody. If you could take your Bibles this morning and open them to the book of Genesis. Chapter 9, beginning there at verse 22. The title of our message this morning is Unforeseen Consequences. You know, when we sin, we usually think it's just going to affect us and our relationship with God, but that's not how sin works. Uh, The effects of sin often affect other people that we don't even realize it's affecting. And we certainly see that this morning in our account, the historical account of the sin of Ham uh, against his father Noah. Uh, One more shout out to VBS. Wasn't that awesome? Let's do that. Uh, My daughter's just now to the point where she's letting me call her by her regular name now. She had a stage name, and so (laughs) she kept telling me to call her by her stage name, and so we've kind of back to normal a little bit. So So it was a wonderful week. And the problem with working with kids all week is you start to treat everyone like a kid. So if you guys are good listeners... Put your hand on your head, (laughs) and we'll have a snack for you afterwards. Amen? (laughs) Oh, my daughter's in here. I thought she wasn't in here. Sorry about what I said. So we're dealing with the book of Genesis. Genesis chapters 1 through 11 is part one of the book, featuring four events, creation, Uh, what the world was like before sin entered the picture, chapters 1 and 2. And then chapters 3 through 5, what went wrong? Why is our world not the way God designed it? And you have no explanation of it unless you have Genesis 3 and the subsequent chapters in our Bible. Fortunately, there's hope in the midst of it because there's coming one, Jesus Christ, who's going to make all things right. That is predicted as early as Genesis 3, verse 15. And the book of Genesis is going to trace that promise. And that's going to become very important today because we're going to learn through which of Noah's three sons this Messiah is going to come into the world. So keep this verse in the back of your minds because our passage today is going to make a big contribution to that Messiah, identifying him in advance. And then we moved into chapter 6 through 9, which is the third major event, which is the flood. We've seen events before the flood, chapter 6, the flood itself, chapter 7, the receding of the waters, chapter 8, and we find ourselves today, as we have the last few weeks, in Genesis 9, events following the flood, post-flood events. And the Bible highlights two things. Number one, God's covenant with Noah. That covenant starts to get unfolded in Genesis 8, verse 20, and goes all the way through chapter 9, verse 17. That's the origin of human government. And then there's something else that takes place in that post-flood world, and that's post-flood sin. Chapter 9, verse 18 through verse 29, the end of the chapter. Number one, Noah's sin. Verses 18 through 21. Number two, Ham's sin. Verses 22 through 27. And then number three, Noah's death. Verses 28 and 29. We last week studied verses 18 through 21. And we saw the sin of Noah in the close flood world. His drunkenness in his tent And you read that and say, that's a very strange occurrence. I mean, why would the Lord include that story for us? 
And we talked about a lot of different reasons why it's there. One reason it's there is to show that the flood fixed the world on the outside, but it never fixed man completely on the inside. The intent, Genesis 8 verse 21, of man's heart is evil from his youth. And thus we have continuing a need for the Messiah to come to fix man and woman and humanity on the inside. So the promise of a coming Messiah is alive and well, even though the external world has been cleansed. The truth of the matter is you can fix someone on the outside. You can put them in a fresh set of clothes. You could give them a shower. You could give them an education. You could put money in their bank. And you could actually get them to go through some sort of 12-step program or some sort of moral reformation. But the truth of the matter is they're still a sinner dead in their trespasses and sins if they don't have Jesus. Fixing someone on the outside only gets you so far. There has to be an internal transformation on the inside. And the sin of Noah also reveals that Noah is not the Messiah. Noah, his obedience and his walk of faith is so exemplary. You might mistake him for the Messiah. You might mistake him for the fulfillment of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. In fact, back in Genesis 5, I believe it's about verses 26 and 27, his own parents had a very high opinion of him and they thought potentially he could be the Messiah. They said this is the man who is going to eradicate the curse. I'll say a few more words about Genesis 5 a little bit later. Actually, it's not in verses 26 and 27. It's in verses 28 and 29. It says in Genesis 5, 28, Lamech lived 182 years and became the father of a son. And now he called his name Noah, saying, this is the one who will give us rest from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. His own father thought that he could be the one that was predicted in Genesis 3 verse 15 to eradicate the curse. But Noah's performance in the post-flood world, his drunkenness, obviously would disqualify Noah as the Messiah. So there must be somebody else coming. And that someone else, of course, is Jesus Christ. That would be another reason why the drunkenness of Noah is revealed here in Genesis 9. And Genesis 9 verses 18 through 21 also refutes something that we talked a lot about last time called the perseverance of the saints. The perseverance of the saints is a doctrine that you find floating around in many circles today. And it's this idea that if you don't endure in good works until the end of your life, you're not a Christian. John Murray, a advocate of the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, says, this is the perseverance of the saints that we may entertain the faith of our security in Christ only as we persevere in faith and holiness to the end. Many, many people think this way. And consequently, they have almost no assurance of their salvation because their thinking is, have I done enough? Have I resisted temptation enough? Have I persevered enough? And if I haven't, maybe I lost my salvation or maybe I was never one of the elect to begin with. And yet, as you go through the Bible, you see many, many examples, Old Testament and New Testament, of people that were clearly blood-bought saints that did not end well. And we went through many of those examples last time. This may be the first one in the Bible, this man named Noah. There is no doubt that Noah was saved. His name is mentioned in the Hall of Faith. 
Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7, and yet the end of his life didn't seem to go very well, and yet he clearly died and went to heaven. We at Sugarland Bible Church do not teach the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. We teach the preservation of the saints. It places the onus not on ourselves, but on who? On God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. You know, look at the author there, Peter. He was a man that knew all about this. He denied the Lord three times. And yet, he never questioned whether he was one of the elect. He never lost his salvation. What he writes in his epistle is 1 Peter 1, verses 4 and 5. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Peter talked about an inheritance in heaven that he would receive, that we would receive. How do we know we're going to receive it? Because we persevere enough? No, he says, verse 5, we are protected by the power of God through a faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Your entrance into heaven does not depend upon your ability to persevere. If that were true, you would be your own savior. Your entrance into heaven is completely predicated upon God's promise to protect and keep you as his child the moment you trust Jesus Christ as your savior. Now, don't get me wrong, we should live lives of holiness and consecrated obedience But we don't do that for fear that somehow the carpet's going to get ripped out from under us. Many people think they're on probation with God. Gee, if I don't perform well, I'm not his child. We should persevere. We should be holy. We should be consecrated unto God. But it has nothing to do with your arrival into heaven. That's already a done deal. In fact, as I speak today, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're already on a fast track to glory which can't be reversed. And the reason it can't be reversed is it's God, as Peter says, who protects and keeps us. It's not so much us hanging on to God that's the issue, it's the fact that God is hanging on to us, amen? And that makes a world of difference because now when we serve him, we're doing it out of worship and praise and gratitude. We're not doing it out of perpetual fear. And so when you start reading the Bible, you start to see that this perseverance of the saints idea that many people advocate and teach cannot be correct. So now we move into new material and we have a second sin that takes place in the post-flood world. We had Noah's sin, verses 18 through 21, and now we have the sin of Noah's son Ham and the fact that it put Ham's fourth son Canaan under a curse. And these are verses, unfortunately, that have been wrenched from their context to support racism. And we're going to learn today that these verses have nothing to do with what people use them and twist them to mean. But notice, if you will, verse 22, Genesis chapter 9. It says there, Ham the father of Canaan. Now that becomes very important because of what Ham is going to do here. Ham is going to do something that will have a deleterious or negative effect, watch this very carefully, not on the Hamites in general, but on his fourth son. Canaan was the fourth son of Ham. You see that in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 6. It says, The sons of Ham were Cush, that's son number one, Mizraim, that's son number two, Put, that is son number three, and Canaan, that would be son number four. These would be the people that settled in the land of Canaan eventually, which would become the land of Israel. The curse is not on all of the Hamites. But it's limited to the descendants of Ham's fourth son, a man named Canaan. 
And so he is going to be the subject in what follows. And so this idea that Ham is the father of Canaan is repeated. If you go back to chapter 9, verse 18, you'll see it stated there as we entered this paragraph. And now it's stated a second time in verse 22. So what did Ham do that was wrong? Ham is the middle son of Noah. The birth order is Shem, Ham, and Japheth. What does it say there in verse 22? Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his brothers outside. The first major issue here is what was Ham's sin? Noah is drunk in his tent, and Ham, Noah's middle son, did something to Noah. And what exactly happened here? Many, many people teach that this was some kind of sexual sin. Uh, it was incestuous, or some even argue it was rape, or homosexual incest, or something of that nature went on. And they believe that because it talks here about how he saw the nakedness of his father. And they go to another book that Moses wrote, the book of Leviticus, where uncovering nakedness is used to describe sexual sin. In fact, as you go through Leviticus 18 and you go through Leviticus 20, you'll see this phrase used over and over again, uncovering nakedness, and it's used as a euphemism, if you will, for all kinds of sexual misbehavior. For example, in Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 18, it says, You shall not marry a woman in addition to her sister. And as a second wife, while she is alive, thus uncovering her nakedness. So you'll notice in the book of Leviticus, sexual sin is analogized to uncovering one's nakedness. And people say, well, obviously then what happened here was something sexual. However, I think that is to read too much into the passage. I don't have to travel all the way to the book of Leviticus to figure out what was happening here in the book of Genesis. I think it it's suffice to say, without mentioning the exact sin, whatever happened here was disrespectful. That's the issue. Ham disrespected his father. Notice the words here of Hebrew Christian scholar Arnold Fruchtenbaum on this verse. He says, the sin of Ham was that he saw the nakedness of his father. For, for Ham, this was an attack on Noah's privacy. Ham perhaps showed his disrespect for he saw the nakedness with glee. So the moral rectitude of the father was now destroyed. The seeing involved a violation of a boundary. The looking was a negative looking. This looking will be used again in the book of Genesis. In Genesis 19 verse 26 with Lot's wife looking backward. In Exodus 32 verse 20 where it says in that no one can look at God and live. In Judges 13 verse 22 where it says when Manoah said we shall surely die because we have seen or looked upon God. Or in 1 Samuel 6 verse 19 where those who looked into the ark died. However, it does imply that he looked upon the nakedness of his father with glee, not necessarily to derive sexual pleasure from it, but certainly in a mocking tone, making fun of his father, so he told his brethren. The sin of Ham will cause the cursing of his fourth son, and the sin lay in three things. Number one, seeing but failing to cover the father himself as he could have. Number two, telling others about it. And number three, further shaming him and deriding his father. The answer to this is probably a lot simpler than most people make it. Noah was in a vulnerable position. He was drunk in his tent and his drunkenness was inappropriate. And so his son, Ham, rather than covering his father, 
in a respectful sense, sort of made sport of this sin, scandalized it, uh, publicized it, uh, wanted to make sure that his brothers understood exactly what his father had done. It's more the sin of disrespect than anything else. And if the Bible teaches anything, it teaches this, that children should be respectful to their parents. Exodus chapter 21 and verse 17 says, He who curses his father and his mother shall surely be put to death. Now that was under the Old Testament law. I'm glad that's not in effect today. We wouldn't have any youth anymore, I guess. (laughs) But it shows you the heart of God as children are supposed to be respectful and in submission to their parents. Now, parents, of course, have no right to abuse their children. So it's a two-way street. And this is part of the relationships that God himself has set up. And it expresses the heart of God. And apparently that boundary was traversed here concerning what Ham did uh, concerning Noah. You'll notice that he uncovered, not covered. And you see the contrasting mindset in the other brothers These would be Sham and Japheth who did the exact opposite. Notice what their attitude is. It's there in verse 24. When Noah awoke, excuse me, verse 23, but Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father, verse 23, and their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. The the brothers are not looking with glee on what Noah had done. They were trying to actually not look at him, and they were trying to cover him. Ham was doing the exact opposite. He was taking his father in a vulnerable place and scandalizing it and publicizing it, and in the process, traversing a boundary line with God. Different different attitudes are contrasted there. The sinful attitude is contrasted there in verse 22 with the proper attitude that's given there in verse 23. And Noah knew exactly what had happened to him, and we're not told exactly how he knew, but he knew. Because when you look at verse 24, it says, When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him, had done to him. The language there, had done to him, implies that Ham had committed a sin, violated Noah in some way, disrespected Noah in some way. How Noah knew, we don't know. Now, there is something going on here in the Hebrew where it says, when Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done. A lot of commentators including Arnold Fruchtenbaum's commentator will, commentary, will tell you that youngest could easily be translated younger. Not youngest, but younger. And if that's true, and I think it is, that that maintains the proper birth order. The proper birth order is Noah has three sons. Son number one is Shem. Son, son number two, not number three, that we're dealing with here is Ham, and son number three is Japheth. And then you come to verse 25, and this is very interesting because of everything we know about Noah in the book of Genesis, and in the whole Bible for that matter, we don't have any recorded words of Noah. I mean, nowhere do we have in the book of Genesis what Noah said. We have a lot of information about what he did, but nothing about what he said. And so verses 25 through 27 are very interesting because as far as I can tell, these are the only recorded words of Noah found in the book of Genesis. If you look at verse 25, it says, so he said. If you look at the beginning of verse 26, it says, he also said. So Noah is starting to talk Of course, he had been talking all of the time, but now we're actually getting an actual quotation of something he said. And he's reacting to this situation with Ham. 
And in the process, he is giving predictive prophecy. Prophecies about the course of human history emanating from Noah's three sons. And if you want to understand why history has gone the direction it's gone in, it's just a matter of studying these few verses, verses 25, 26, and 27, which are a record of Noah's actual words. Not just words, but predictions or prophecy. Jesus said something very interesting in the upper room in John 13 and verse 19 to his hand-picked disciples. He said, from now on, I'm telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it occurs, you may believe that I am he. And then the next chapter, John 14, verse 29, Jesus says the same thing. Now I have told you before it happens, so that when it happens, you might believe. You'll notice that God does not require people to blindly believe in him, but he gives them evidence. Our faith is not a leap into a dark chasm, but it is a faith built on solid evidences. And one of the things that you have in Christianity that you have in no other holy book, alleged holy book on the earth today is predictive prophecy. One of the unique features of this book is it predicts the future. And many of the prophecies, sort of like the ones that are given here in verses 25 through 27, you can show in history how they were very literally fulfilled. Jesus in the upper room told the disciples, look, we're coming up on Passion Week. This is Passion Week. I'm going to die. I'm going to resurrect. I'm going to ascend to heaven. And I'm going to start making a series of short-term predictions. And as these short predictions come to pass, you'll know who I am. You'll know that I am He. Another way of saying I am God. With the purpose, verse 29, of believing And so this becomes the value of studying verses 25 through 27. Seeing how they have come to pass in history, which gives us great confidence that the Bible must be from God. Because only God can know the end from the beginning and is able here through Noah to reveal history in advance. And so what exactly did Noah say as he awoke from his drunken slumber? Verse 25, so he said, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brothers. Now notice that first expression there, cursed be Canaan. A curse came upon not the Hamites as a whole. And this is the error of the racist viewpoint that the black race or skin color coming from Ham is under some sort of curse. That's not what it says here in the Bible. This is a curse that is narrowly tailored just to the descendants of Ham, Ham's fourth son that settled in the land of Canaan. So one question that comes up is why in the world would God curse his fourth son because of what Ham had done? Many people argue that there's some sort of genetic curse in the Canaanites. But that would be contrary to God's nature. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20 says this, The person who sins shall die. A son will not suffer the punishment for the father's guilt, nor will a father suffer the punishment of the son's guilt. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of uh, of the wicked upon himself. When God brings judgment, he doesn't do it because of something someone else did in one's family tree. He holds everybody accountable for their own sin. 
And if that is true, and I think it's a true principle of God, it's a fair principle, it's an equitable principle, it's articulated in Ezekiel 18 verse 20 as I just read. Why in the world would Noah, as God is giving Noah an oracle, why would Noah pronounce a curse on Ham's fourth son for something his father did? And I think there's a simple answer to that. And the answer goes something like this. The apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. When children see sinful behavior in their parents, they will likely go into their lives imitating that same sinful behavior. And because Noah's fourth son imitated the disrespect that was involved here as evidenced in their father as Ham disrespected Noah, they imitated that. They had no uh, real respect for God's boundaries as they settled into the land of Canaan and they were a people that became lawless. When I was uh, just starting out in ministry, I was under a pastor... And he said to me, I want you to watch something very, very carefully. He said, there are parents that will come to this church and they will treat it like a babysitting service. In other words, they'll bring their kids to church, but they themselves won't come to church. They look at it as a break from their kids. They go out and read the paper or, you know, check up on the sporting events, and then they'll come back and pick up their kids when the services are over. The church to them is nothing more than a babysitting service. And he says, I want you to watch what happens to the children of those parents as the children get older and start to make their own decisions. Once they reach the age of, let's say, 16, 17, 18, 19, etc., and they are on their own and they start making their decisions, he says it, it almost works to a person that children of such a family will stop attending church themselves. Why? Because it was really never role modeled in their parents. Uh, it was never treated as something that was sanctified, special, holy, not so much in what their parents said, but what their parents did. Mom and dad don't think church is a big deal, so now that I'm on my own and can make my own decisions, I don't think church is a big deal. And as they began to make their own decisions, they would leave the church. And he said, I want you to compare that to the parents who not only bring their kids to church, but they actually come into the church themselves. They come into the church service. They don't treat it like a babysitting service. They want to be a part of the church. And watch what happens to those kids as they get older. They will stick with the church, unlike the other children, because church attendance was something that was not just verbally taught to them. It was role modeled. And you see, this is the power of parents over children. Your best sermons to your children and your grandchildren are going to come from not so much what we say, but what we do, what we we role model. And if we're not role modeling authentic Christianity in our behavior, we can tell our kids to go to church all we want but they're not going to take it seriously because they see no example in their parents. See, it's, it's one thing in a family to tell your kids you need to pray. It's a totally different situation when mom and dad say, okay, let's get together and let's all get down on our knees before the Lord. A circumstance has come up and let's pray about this. Now a child is seeing role modeled what is important by way of priorities to those parents. And you see, this is what happened with the fourth son of Ham. He developed a lot of bad tendencies. 
And that followed him into his settlement in Canaan. And the Canaanites themselves continued on with those bad tendencies. It's not a situation where God is cursing Canaan because of what his father had done. It's a situation where the apple does not fall too far from the tree. And I can guarantee you that when Ham did this to Noah, he wasn't even thinking about his descendants. He wasn't thinking about his children. He wasn't thinking about his great-grandchildren. He probably saw it as some kind of private sin between him and the Lord, between him and his father. But that's not how sin works. Sin has unforeseen consequences moving sometimes into the role modeling of the behavior of the next generation or generations that we can't even see. That's why I've entitled this message, Unforeseen Consequences. Romans 6 verse 23 says, for the wages of sin is what? It's death. What is a wage? A wage is a price. It's a cost. And sometimes the costs and the wages are unforeseen. We can't even see them. Sometimes we're saying things and doing things which are going to affect the next generation. Or maybe we're just not doing things that we should be doing that are going to affect the next generation And we don't even consider what it is we're doing. See, this is the situation here with Ham. And that's why a curse, I believe, fell upon his fourth son. His fourth son, Canaan, picked up a lot of bad cues from dad. And his children picked up a lot of bad cues from him. And that's why the Canaanites moved into this godless society. Ultimately, in the land of Canaan that ultimately had to be physically eradicated by Joshua. You have to sort of put yourself in the position of those that we're affecting when we sin. Because there's a lot of people that we may affect that we can't even see. You remember the turning point in the book of 2 Samuel? What turns everything in the book of 2 Samuel is David's adultery and ultimately murder to cover up his adultery. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. He killed Uriah the Hittite to cover up what he had done. And then David is confronted by the prophet Nathan about this, you recall. And look very carefully at Nathan's words. They're in 2 Samuel 12 and verse 10. It says, now then, and watch the change in pronouns here. Now then the sword shall never depart from your house. What's his house? It's his family. The sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Well, David probably thought this is just between me and Uriah. This is just between me and Bathsheba. This is just between me and God. But God says through Nathan, no, this is going to affect your house or your household or your descendants. There's going to be a situation where the sword is not going to depart from your house. Innocent bystanders. Because of what you've done. Unforeseen consequences. We don't think of sin this way. Oh, at worst I'm just hurting myself, we think. No, you're not. You're hurting everybody that's taking their cues from you. Especially those living in your own household. Because as a man, you're the high priest of the house. That's what the Bible says about you. You may not want the job, but God never asked you whether you want the job or not. It's yours. You have incredible power and influence in that house as the leader of that house, speaking now to the men. And what you do or don't do is going to have an effect on your wife It's going to have an effect on your children. It's going to have an effect on your grandchildren. The unforeseen consequences of sin. 
And this then becomes the apologetic for the eradication of the Canaanites. When Moses penned this book, the book of Genesis, you have to ask yourself, who was the original audience? Who was this written for originally? Well, the original audience would be the Hebrews that had just come out of the Exodus, had received the law of Moses at Mount Sinai, and were now en route to Canaan, who under Joshua, they will be told to eradicate the Canaanites. Now, that seems like a harsh command. Why would God command that? Because there had been centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries of disrespect for the law of God. And it just was like a snowball effect. It got so wicked and evil that God had no choice but to eradicate the Canaanites as the nation of Israel would enter the promised land. How bad did it get? It's in your Bible. Read Leviticus 18 and read Leviticus 20 where it describes levels of sexual sin that are so grotesque it would be difficult for me to read those passages publicly even in the church world. And all of the archaeological remnants that we have of that time period, the, the sexualized imagery, the, 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 the disgusting things that were happening. God said, sin has finally reached full bloom. And what you need to do is you need to go into Canaan and you need to eradicate the Canaanites. And Israel did it and they got about a C- minus as they did it. They left some Canaanites alive as recorded in the book of Joshua, as recorded in the book of Judges. And for 800 years, <laughs> those living Canaanites in the land that should have been eradicated became a source of consternation for Israel, leading Israel ultimately back into the same sin, leading to the Babylonian captivity, a time of discipline 800 years later. And if you're under Joshua's watch and you're one of his soldiers and you want to know why is it that God has issued this command to eradicate the Canaanites, you've got the story of the book of Genesis right in front of you. Because you're the original audience. And you could see where all of this Canaanite debauchery came from. It started with what Ham did to Noah by way of disrespect and somebody was watching. And that someone watching was Ham's fourth son who learned similar detestable practices and he passed them on to his children and his children passed them on to their children and their children passed them on to their children. And so finally you get to Genesis chapter 15 and verse 16 where God says this, then in the fourth generation, they will return here for the iniquity of the Amorite. That's a subsection within Canaan, a people group within Canaan. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. God just let the snowball roll and roll and roll and roll until finally it got to a point where God says it's enough. I want you to go in there and I want you to execute every single one of them man, woman, and child. I want you to even kill their animals. And how different the history of Israel would have been if they did exactly what God said, but they didn't. They let a few live. Kind of sounds like us, doesn't it? We've got a sinful habit in our life and the Holy Spirit says, deal with this right now. Well, Lord, I'm a slave to it. I don't have the power to deal with it. And God says, I've taken care of that. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. You need to deal with this. You need to cut it off. You need to fix this now. Under my power. And we just let it fester. And let it live. And eventually what happens is the tail starts to, to wag the dog. Eventually the Canaanites, leaving a few left, 
The tail started wagging the dog to the point where the whole nation of Israel went into corruption because that's the nature of sin. It, it, it spreads like yeast through the lump of dough. Galatians chapter 5 verse 9. We don't deal with things when God says deal with them and we suffer consequences down the road. But where did it all start? It started right here. It started right here with what Ham did to Noah and what Canaan picked up and learned from this lack of respect towards his father. You'll notice there in verse 25 as we continue on. So he said, cursed be Canaan. Watch this now. A servant of servants. This is what you call a superlative in Hebrew. It's like saying the ultimate. It's uh, like saying the holy of holies. When you say the holy of holies, you're not talking about a holy place. You're talking about the ultimate holy place. That's what a superlative is. And so when Noah says prophetically, cursed is Canaan, he's talking about how Canaan is going to be an abject slavery. And then he says who he's going to be enslaved to. Verse 25, and let Canaan, excuse me, he, verse 25, very end of the verse, he shall be to his brothers. So Canaan is going to be a slave to the two other brothers of Noah, Ham and Joppeth. Excuse me, Shem and Joppeth. There we go. And exactly how all of that is unpacked is given in more specific prophecies, verses 26 and 27. But look at very carefully at the language. This is a curse not on all the Hamites, as racists teach. This is a curse that fell only upon Noah's fourth son and was limited to the land of Canaan. We move now into verse 26, where there's actually some good news in this. God, in the worst of circumstances, can take lemons and turn them into what? Lemonades. And we actually have some good news here as he starts dealing with Shem. Look at what he says there in Genesis 9. Look at, if you will, at verse 26. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servants. Now we have a blessing pronounced on Shem, the oldest son, who was not involved with Ham's sin. And here we're starting to get a focus or a picture of the sovereignty of God. No matter how bad it gets, no matter how dark it gets, no matter how difficult it gets, no matter how adverse it gets, God is still in control. Amen? And God is actually going to use negative circumstances to bring about his positive results. And he does something spectacular here in verse 26 where he narrows the focus on the coming Messiah. Look, if you will, at Genesis 9 verse 26 again. He said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. There's a Messiah that's coming. We know that from Genesis 3, verse 15. And here we learn that this Messiah is coming from the descendants of, not of Ham, not of Japheth, but of Shem. Let me back up just for a minute, if I could. Generally speaking, the descendants of Ham settled in Africa, the descendants of his fourth son settled in the land of Canaan. The descendants of Japheth settled in Asia, uh, ultimately Europe, North America, and from the descendants of Shem, from the word Shem, we get the word Semite, came the Semitic people groups of the earth the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Persians. Ultimately, the Hebrews would be born from the descendants 
of Shem. And now we have a very specific prophecy concerning what would happen to Shem's line. Arnold Fruchtenbaum describes it as follows. Genesis 9 verse 26 focuses on Shem combining a blessing and a cursing. The blessing is, blessed be Jehovah, the God of Shem. It is the God of Shem and not Shem himself which was blessed. Shem will uniquely possess the knowledge of God. Therefore, the seed of the woman will come through Shem and not through Ham and not through Japheth. Now, when we started this study today, I told you to keep an eye on Genesis 3, verse 15. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 is the first prophecy of a coming Messiah. It was announced immediately after the fall of man in Eden and God said at that time I will put enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed he shall bruise you on the head you shall bruise him on the heel hey there's coming one who's going to make things right there's coming one from the seed of the woman Eve who will reverse the consequences of the fall and all the book of Genesis is doing is tracing that coming one It starts with Adam and Eve, and then it's traced through Seth. And then it's traced through Noah. Because Genesis 5 has a long genealogy linking Adam to Noah. That's probably why Noah's father thought Noah was the Messiah. Sounds like a typical parent, doesn't it? My child is so great, he must be the Messiah. No, he's not the Messiah because he got drunk in the post-flood world. We must be looking for someone else. And you'll notice what just happened here is the lineage got narrowed through Shem because we really don't know through which of these three sons the Messiah is going to come. Is the Messiah going to be a Japhethite, a Hamite? No, he's going to come through the line of Shem. He's going to come through the Semitic people groups of the earth we just don't know yet that he will come through the Hebrew nation when we get to the story of Adam Isaac and Jacob that's where we learn that the Messiah is going to be Jewish Genesis 12 verse 3 he's coming through Adam's line Genesis 21 verse 12 he's coming through Isaac's line within Abraham's line Genesis 25 verse 23 he is coming through of all of Isaac's descendants he's coming through Jacob now this gets complicated because Jacob had a lot of kids we call them the 12 tribes of Israel Jacob's dozen So through which of these tribes within the land of Israel is the Messiah going to come from? By the time you leave the book of Genesis, you know exactly which tribe he's coming from. It's in Genesis 49 verse 10. He's coming from the tribe of Judah. This was why when Herod wanted to kill the firstborn in Bethlehem and he asked his religious leaders through which of these areas is the Messiah going to come from from which city they knew who who that he was coming from Bethlehem in the tribe of Judah how did they know that were they prophets no they were good readers they were good studiers of the prophets they were good students of the book of Genesis and so this is just a wonderful thing that is being unfolded now by way of good news, as we know that the Messiah is going to be a Shemite, Semitic, ultimately Jewish. I can get myself stoned to death in Texas for saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Jesus was not a Southern Baptist. (laughs) Nor was he a Presbyterian, nor was he a Methodist. Jesus, he wasn't even a member of a Bible church, for goodness sake. He was as Jewish as they come. That's why when you get into the New Testament, you see Christ over and over again traveling to Jerusalem to honor the feasts of Israel because that's what Jews did. 
And this is all starting to develop here in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 26. But notice the second part of the verse. This is very interesting. There's also a curse. And it says, let Canaan, the fourth son of Ham, let Canaan be his servant. So, interestingly, the Messiah is coming from the lineage of Shem, but Canaan, Ham's fourth son, is going to serve Shem. As you go through the Bible, you start to see how this actually got fulfilled in real history. For example, notice Genesis 14, verses 1 through 4. Verse 1 of Genesis 14 talks about a king, the king of Elam. Elam is modern day Iran, which used to be called Persia until about 1935. So this is talking about a descendant of Shem. And then when you look at Genesis 14 and verse 3, it talks about those living in Sodom. In Canaan, this was before Joshua eradicated the Canaanites, and it says there all these kings, what kings? In Sodom, in Canaan, Canaanites, descendants ultimately of Ham. All these kings came as allies to the valley of Sidim, that is the Salt Sea. For 12 years they had served this king from Elam, For 12 years. So you move from Genesis 9 into Genesis 14 and you see, oh my goodness, this prophecy is starting to be fulfilled. That the descendants of uh, of Canaan would become subservient to the descendants of Shem. And then when you go to 1 Kings chapter 9 verses 20 and 21... It says this, as for all the people who were, who were left of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and the Electric Lights, <laughs> and the Out of Sights, and the Termites, and the Mosquito Bites. See, I got to throw little things in and make sure you're awake. Who are, who are all these ites? These are the descendants of Ham, ultimately Canaan. And what does it say there in 1 Kings 9, verse 20, leading into verse 21? It says, the sons of Israel conscripted them as forced laborers. They became servants or slaves, these Canaanites, of the Shemites, just like Noah said would happen. It's just a fascinating thing to me that when God speaks something, you better pay attention to what he says. Because it may seem impossible that such a prophecy could ever come to pass, but eventually, history is going to catch up to God's prophetic word. Because God, who is not limited by time, can see tomorrow as if it's today. He's outside of time. This becomes one of the great proofs of the Bible, that the Bible must be from God. Because only the Bible does this. You find nothing like this in the Quran or any alleged holy book upon the earth, but this matter of predictive prophecy is unique to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in which I say to that, praise the Lord. But what about Japheth? What's going to happen to him? Well, we know that Canaan, Ham's fourth son, is going to be put under a curse because of his behavior that he learned from his father. We know that the Messiah is going to come from the line of Shem, the Semitic people groups of the earth. Well, doesn't the Bible have anything to say about Japheth? And you better believe it does. You just have to come back next week to learn about it (laughs) because we're out of time. But the truth of the matter is, talking about 
the fourth son coming under a curse. Here's the reality of the situation. The whole human race is under a curse. Not necessarily because of what our fathers did or our grandfathers did, but our ultimate great, 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 great grandfather, what Adam did. In Adam's sin, we sinned all. And the truth of the matter is, when Adam committed that transgression in Eden, you were there committing the same sin. And I guess God could have put every single one of us in Eden and we would have done the exact same thing. So all of us are guilty in that sense. But the good news of it is there's a last Adam. He's not the second Adam. Don't misquote the scripture. The Bible never calls Jesus the second Adam because if there was a second Adam, you could have a third one and a fourth one and a fifth one. No, he was the last Adam. He's the final act. And he came into the world to reverse what the first Adam had done. He came into the world to reverse our guilt through his sinless life. And then by dying on a cross and paying the full penalty for our sins. And he's given us now what we call the gospel good news. Something free. Something that you can only receive from God as a gift. And you can only receive this from God as a gift by fulfilling a single condition, which is to believe, which is a synonym for saying to trust or to rely upon what Jesus did. Only Jesus, as the last Adam, could reverse the negative consequences of the first Adam. And the moment a lost sinner a rebel in Adam's race places their trust in Jesus, their whole identity changes. They're no longer under the judgment of God, the wrath of God, hurling towards a Christless eternity, but now they are under the benefits of the last Adam who absorbed the wrath of a holy God in our place. And that's what we trust in. Christianity is not about us trying harder to get better. It's about trusting in the one who did everything in our place. This man, Jesus Christ. And so we like to conclude all of our services here with an invitation for people in the building or outside of the building or listening online or listening on the archive after the fact to go ahead and exercise that faith in Jesus. It's not a situation where we ask people to join the church, walk an aisle, give money. It's a matter of privacy between them and the Lord where the Spirit convicts them of their need to do this. And we place our trust in the last Adam. And that's the gospel. This is not 12 steps to God. This is a single step. And if it's something that you want to do um, or something that the Holy Spirit has been bothering you to do, then do it. Because God loves you too much to see you go into a Christless eternity. That's why he's annoying you. He wants you to trust in him. And it's that, at that point you find your security in him. That's the gospel as best I can explain it. If it's something that anybody here needs more explanation on, I'm available after the service to talk, shall we pray? Father, we're grateful for this ancient record of history concerning what went wrong after the flood, how those are even life lessons for us and how they pave the way for what is happening even today in world history and the coming of Jesus Christ himself. Help us to be good stewards of these truths, not only by way of teaching, but also living as we walk these things out this week. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said.